Um, I'm actually going to dive into Microsoft's Blue Keep vulnerability today. And I'll share with you a little bit around what healthcare organizations need to know and how to prepare for future exposures around the Blue Keep vulnerability. A little bit about myself. Um, my name is Ben Pearson. I run our product marketing, but I also run our technical pre-sales. I've actually been working in this healthcare industry for a number of years. Uh, my wife is a clinical engineer. My mom's a nurse. My sister's a respiratory therapist. So I, uh, I've lived and breathed healthcare my whole life. And um, so I'm excited about this topic. Uh, it, it reminds me of the WannaCry vulnerability that came out a couple of years ago. That's why I wanted to bring this topic to the table and share what I know about it, um, discuss with you all um, what it is, and uh, some of the things you can think about when you think about protecting the medical devices within your hospitals as well. So when you think about hospitals and the challenges that you're faced with, and you know, I've spoken with over 100 hospitals over the course of the last few years, that includes big, large service, you know, service providers. That includes OEMs. That includes um, also uh, even health systems that span the entire country, not just in the U.S. but also internationally. And um, what happened when WannaCry released a couple of years ago was you saw this sort of finger pointing, right? You saw, you know, is the OEM, is the manufacturer of the medical device responsible for, for providing the hospital the patch, the workaround, the whitelisting procedures, right, to actually protect that medical device? Um, or the service providers that you've outsourced to, are they responsible for providing that, providing that support of the medical devices that they, you've outsourced to them under contract to maintain and, and protect? Ultimately, in the end, it's the hospitals that are holding the responsibility in the end. And that's, that's the answer I've gotten from CISOs, from the IT leaders, from the HTM organization was, they're like, we're putting our patients on these devices. It's our responsibility in the end to make sure that these medical devices are protected and secured. Well, the challenge in that case is, well, what devices do you have that are, one, vulnerable, that are running that operating system, that are running, that have that particular threat available to it that's on your network? You know, where are those devices at? I mean, we have one of our customers that's going through a process of locating tens of thousands of medical devices to address this uh, particular uh, vulnerability, right? And how do you fix them? What's the procedures to fix them? So these are some of the challenges, again, back to the ownership and accountability and how do uh, hospitals and, and healthcare organizations address making sure that they are protected. And like I said, we certainly are still talking to the manufacturer side. We have a manufacturer, healthcare manufacturing customers. We have healthcare service provider customers. So we're wanting to encourage them as well to look at this, address this, and take ownership of this as it relates to their medical devices they're selling to the hospitals and supporting within the hospitals. But in the end, the HDM organization and the, uh, the IT security organization ultimately within the hospital is accountable to make sure that this is taken care of. Again, so if you have questions, use the question on the right-hand side. Apologies, you didn't hear me earlier. Um, so if you wanna ask questions, there is a question option on the right. Feel free to drop in questions as we go throughout the session today. So first of all, what is BlueKey? What is this vulnerability that was just disclosed on May 16th this year? Um, so because this is a this is being considered a serious threat, and uh, it, it does, like I said, does remind me of of WannaCry, um, and so that's why we, I wanted to bring this topic to the table. So what this is, this is the, the common vulnerabilities and exposures number for you uh, if you want to look this up. But this, what this is, is if you're running a legacy operating system, a legacy Windows operating system specifically that has remote desktop protocol. And if you're not familiar with what remote desktop protocol is, it is a protocol that allows an IT administrator, for example, or a help desk administrator to be able to remote desktop into supporting a PC, right? So it allows them to see the screen, it allows them to remotely control the screen, but it allows a lot more. The port number is 3389 specifically. Um, so that's the threat there is that you're running a legacy operating system with this particular port and this service, RDP, turned on, um, that's the threat. And the reason this threat is so serious is that it requires little to no technical and security expertise. It's uh, it's fairly easy to exploit, specifically. There's a lot of videos out there on YouTube, if you guys want to take a look, of people exploiting it and showing exactly how simple it is using a command line to exploit it and run remote code on the vulnerable operating system. In this case, it could be a vulnerable medical device, right? And that's why we're talking about this today. So why is this so bad, right? Why is this blue key vulnerability such a, a, a bad issue, a, a bad item within a hospital? 
The first thing is it's, it's resident. This, this threat is resident in these older unsupported operating systems, right? These older unsupported operating systems um, you know, aren't being patched by Microsoft. And in some, a lot of cases aren't even being patched by your medical device manufacturers. They may have gone you know, end of life, may have gone end of support because you guys are running medical devices for 10 to 15 to 20 years within a hospital well past the life of a Windows supported operating system and patched operating system, right? So that's the first point. The second is it's pre-authentication. What that means is the, the hackers, the attackers, they don't even need stolen credentials. So if you guys have you know, password uh, restrictions and you know, have very strong password requirements within your hospitals, especially for your medical devices, that's irrelevant. And, and attackers don't even need those stolen credentials to actually exploit this vulnerability. They just need access to a medical device on your network that is running this legacy operating system with this particular RDP port active and open, right? And then the thing about it is it can spread quickly and, and this can spread horizontally. So if once one device gets affected, they can crawl device to device, sort of land and expand uh, device to device within your hospital and find other vulnerable medical devices or other devices that have the same threat uh, um, that is available to it. So once it gets into your hospital, it can spread device to device as well. What it also can do is it can install software on the device. So it has read, it has read, it can read malware, for example, onto the device without admin or other credentials. So basically it has full access to your medical device just by being by having that direct access and installing that software on a device. So that's the threat there. And like I mentioned earlier, strong password management doesn't do anything to reduce the risk. It just leverages that open port, leverages that vulnerable operating system to be able to gain access to that medical device with full access. It also requires very little hacking experience to exploit this, right? It requires just access to an RDP enabled device and public knowledge of pre-authentication security gap, which is now widely available. And as I mentioned, you can go out to YouTube, you can watch people running their command lines, running this attack against the device. You can see how it does not require any authentication to actually do it. And it can run a payload, meaning it can run a application, run a, a script uh, against uh, your particular device. So what happens is the hacker sets up this static virtual channel, and it's, it's named MST120, on a channel other than 31, and that leads to a heap memory corruption and a remote code execution. In the end, what that means is they can remotely install and run code without any access controls to those devices. And then the code required to do this is, like I said, primitive. Even novice hackers can do this type of, of hack. That's why, that's why you're seeing uh, all the posts around the concern and it's why Microsoft themselves stepped up, and I'm, I was very pleased to see that, and provided patches for even their out-of-date, unsupported, unpatching, previously operating systems um, because of their, their concern for this vulnerability. So what is RDP? I shared a little bit about what rem a remote desktop protocol is. Again, it allows that remote user to take control of a device. If you've ever called into a call center and the, and the person at the other end of the call center has remoted into your PC and drove your mouse, to fix something on your computer, that's RDP. That's what they're using to actually gain access. It's designed to, traditionally for laptop compute, laptops and desktop computers, traditionally. And it's traditionally used from a, usually a support perspective. IT support typically uses this protocol to remote into the PC, right? To be able to support and troubleshoot servers, laptops, desktops, et cetera. Uh, like I said, it's, it's that IT administrator. That's usually where this comes in. But in some cases, this is enabled and installed and active even on a medical device because it's running in under the hood, still a Windows operating system, which can have remote desktop protocol turned on even on a medical device for remote support. So what are the vulnerable operating systems? So these are the five that are vulnerable. So it's Windows 2003, it's Windows XP, it's Windows 7, Windows Server 2008, Windows Server 2008 R2 all out-of-date operating systems uh, from, from a Microsoft standpoint. Um, but like I mentioned, Microsoft does have patches now for all of these operating systems uh, available on its website. And I'll point you to that link once we get done today. So why is healthcare particularly vulnerable? It's the same reason that healthcare was particularly vulnerable when we thought about WannaCry. The exact same reason is the 70% of devices in healthcare organizations are running in a lot of cases unsupported operating systems. This is projection right now by 2020 of January, just, just around the corner here. 
a 70 or 70% of medical devices in healthcare organizations are going to be a running an unsupported operating system. So, and, and I know that it's already at a high level, um, just because of the nature of medical devices, as I mentioned, running for 10, 15, 20 years, most operating systems from a windows perspective are only supported in some cases up to five years, uh, you know, seven years in some cases, but not, not we're nowhere near what a medical device is going to run within a hospital. Right. Operating systems in healthcare, if you kind of look at the mix, you know, the, the statistic is 59% of, of medical devices are running Windows operating systems in healthcare. 41% are running a variant of other operating systems, whether that be a Linux operating system, an embedded firmware operating system, some other form of, of operating system as well, Android uh, OS. Uh, so in some cases, there's a, a variant, but most are Windows uh, within a hospital organization. So that's the challenge. So patching in a healthcare environment, it, it is challenging, right? It's not as easy as, you know, your traditional, you know, corporate environment, right? Where I have PCs and desktops and servers, that's easy, right? Um, you know, I ran a patch management uh, team actually when I worked in aerospace and defense as well. And uh, that was actually fairly easy to patch. We had tools and software like Microsoft SCCM and, or, or, or SMS or even, you know, Windows, uh, you know, WSUS, Windows Update Server. Um, so you had multiple options of quickly deploying patches, but the challenge in healthcare, right, as you guys all probably know, is, you know, you know in the cases of, you know, healthcare, you have a lot of operating systems. The statistic I pulled was 40% of healthcare deployments that are running, they have over 20 different operating systems in their environment. So it's fairly complex in terms of just the number of operating systems. Medical devices drive some, a lot of that complexity. Um, you also don't have the, the luxury of, of patching like you do in a, a traditional corporate environment, right? Patching medical devices requires a lot of cases getting patches from the manu manufacturer um, or manually physically touching the device itself to provide those patches onto the medical devices directly because traditional patching tools aren't allowed and rightfully so. You don't want a medical device rebooting in the middle of the day because uh, patch Tuesday hit, right? right? So um, another statistic is 30% of healthcare deployments had more than 100 device vendors. So you're now dealing with also the complexity of just the sheer volume of vendors, manufacturers within a hospital, as opposed to a corporate environment where you have, you know, one or two or three, maybe 10, but nowhere near the amount of, of sheer vendors you got to support, right? Whether it be, you know, your Siemens, your GEs, your Philips, your Toshibas, and the, and the list goes on, right? Um, and now as medical devices, more and more are getting connected to the network. Um, I've actually heard statistics somewhere around 15 to 20% of medical devices are IP enabled and connected to the network. I know that's only going up. That number I, I heard uh, was last year. Um, so it is driving more and more devices to be addressed, especially com customers and, and healthcare organizations that have tens, if not hundreds of thousands of medical devices that they're now supporting, right? Um, if we look at, you know, for example, the, the, if you look at that number of medical devices, 85% of medical devices running a Windows operating system had SMB turned on um, and when it's often unnecessary. So this is just, just another statistic that allows that remote applications and users to access files on the device. This is just one example that, you know, because this SMB vulnerability was turned on, this is back to that WannaCry example, this is how WannaCry got in. SMB was turned on on medical devices when it wasn't necessarily needed for the device to function. Um, and what happened was WannaCry leveraged that SMB server message block vulnerability. It's another protocol, just like RDP is a protocol. It this, this, this protocol obviously is different with RDP, but this want, WannaCry leverage the same sort of attack method as, as, um, as we're dealing with here today. So just wanna share a little bit of statistics around that. And again, um, like I said, this is the threat. That's what, I'm, what we're gonna discuss more today. So why are we hosting this webinar? Um, you guys, this is, uh, you know, this is part of our business, what we do, we, uh, we sell software into healthcare, so we feel it's, we're, we have an obligation to educate the healthcare community, um, and we also have a solution to help address some of this as well. I'll, I'll get into a demo here in just a second. So the gap does exist between vulnerability scanning products. So traditionally, IT has their scanning tools in a healthcare environment, but the challenge is, is that they don't necessarily know what if they find an IP address, they find a threat, I find an out-of-date Windows operating system. I find that it, it isn't, it's running and has an RDP port open on it. It's not patched. Um, 
they typically don't know, is that a medical device or not? I know it's IP, I know it's Mac, I know it's subnet, all that, but I don't know necessarily know it's a medical device. So simply identifying and cataloging all connected medical devices can be a challenge, right? Knowing what your inventory is and what state is it in and the details about it is really the foundation you have to lay to be able to know what state you're, you're in, right? If you think about it, do you know what medical devices are connected to your network? Do you know the details about those medical devices? And that's the question I usually ask when I, when I sit down and talk to a hospital. In a lot of cases, it's no, I don't. And that's, that's the challenge they're faced with. Um, and do you have any automation to remediate those vulnerabilities um, in your environment? In a lot of cases, they don't exist or it's manual. Um, so um, the other next pieces are really around more of those details, right? So do you have enough information to say, where is this device? What department owns the device? Is it under warranty? Is it supported by a service provider, right? Who, who's responsible for patching it? Is it HTM? Is it the vendor? Is it, right? Is it IT? And some of those vulnerabilities and devices may not be connected at that time when you do that initial scan. So it has to be an ongoing process, right? So if it's in a clean room, if it's in, you know, in, out for repair, and maybe unplugged, right? It may be in one of your uh, spare closets, right? And so you may not catch it during that initial scan. So things to think about. So vulnerability scanning is like only part of the solution, right? So if we look at this, this report, Forescout put out, so you can certainly look this up. They provide recommendations on how organizations can develop and implement an enterprise-wide security and risk management strategy. And that's absolutely something you, if you aren't looking at, you should look at, is looking at how you have an actual strategy around your, your medical devices risk management and how you're you're driving that strategy across how you're maintaining how you're managing how you're tracking those medical devices across your hospitals so it's not just sufficient to simply detect that the device has an ip address you need to also know all of its additional details its purpose its owner its security posture right how do i respond if there's a if there's an attack on those devices and having a plan in place for that so you can read more on that it is a good report out there you can certainly take a look at from file four scout all right, so just diving a little deeper into the traditional method, when we think about sort of the, the legacy ways of detecting if there's a vulnerability, if there's a threat, and do I know what to do, right? So this is kind of the, I'll call it kind of the legacy way of, of running things and nothing against it, it's just kind of, like I said, this is somewhat of a newer threat as we think about more and more of these threats attacking and going after medical devices in the last few years. But traditionally, what we saw was in the left-hand column here, this vulnerability scanning systems. You have these network security and monitoring systems at the bottom. They're out there monitoring your networks. They're monitoring your subnets, the devices connected to the network, and they're able to get information. So let's say there is a security event. When it does occur, and one of these systems detects it, and these are your IT teams typically running these systems, a lot of times they're able to get some detail, right? I, there's, a, there's a security event that occurred. There's this vulnerable device on my network right? And, but all I get back is an IP address, a MAC address of this affected device. And the IT organization looks at this and sees that this came into their security operations console. Well, is this a, an OT or operating technology? Is a medical device, right? What kind of device is it? You know, what manufacturer, what model? You know, where is it at? Where physically is it? Obviously, they could trace down to a port. They could physically, you know, figure out where that device is. But what department owns it? Who do you contact? And how do you remediate this, this threat and this concern? This is the legacy ways of, of looking at looking at the challenge that, that you're faced with. And we look at Novolo, this is kind of one of the roles that we play in this. And I'll talk more about this. So now with Novolo's cybersecurity module, and this ties into our CMMS. So Novolo has a medical device CMMS that allows you to track your inventory. And then what we've added is a module for OT cybersecurity that allows you to do automation. I'll talk more about this. So now on the left-hand side, there's vulnerability scanning systems, right? Now there's new ones out there and we are partnered with pretty much every one of them. So Zingbox, uh, CloudPost, Order, Assimile, Medigate, and uh, CyberMDX and kind of list goes on. There's a lot of them out there now um, that are specifically focused on medical devices. Um, so when they're scanning the network, they're scanning, they're able to now, when they detect a, a manufacturer, a model, a detail on your network, they actually can correlate that against Novolo's inventory. And we have a, a direct integration to all of those providers and it's bi-directional integration. So what happens now is I find a vulnerable medical device, right? I have some detail. I'm going to check with Novolo's integration, our cybersecurity module against what device is it? Great. It's one of your medical devices. We found it. We matched it against the MAC address, the, the host name of the device, 
We match it against the key details that we have within our inventory. And then from there, we enrich that data. We set up and we put additional data back into Nivolo for, you know, what's its, what's its current IP address, right? What's, what's the threat? And even doing automation in the top here around automating work order creation, right? Maybe I want to kick off a work order clinical engineering to address it. And that's where Nivolo comes in as well. So now you've got your facilities team, you get your clinical team that's automatically can get work orders based on the details and even finding out where are these devices physically located. And I'll show that in a demo I'm gonna show in just a second on exactly how we tie in with even things like your real-time location services in your hospital to pinpoint exactly where the devices are even right now. Even IT is aware now. IT now has the data as well. We can push data right into your IT security operations console. So they know this is a, a medical device they know the details of the medical device, and they now know here's the work order that, of the clinical engineer in the HTM department that's actually taking action and working on that device. So we're able to get that full uh, additional details from a medical device within your inventory. All right, I'm gonna pause for just a second. Are there any questions from any of the folks on the call before we dive into a, a brief product demonstration? Okay, all right, well, great. Hopefully, again, this has been very informative for you. So let's let's dive into a demo here really quick and just show you a little bit about what we're talking about. Um, so this is, by the way, the Microsoft patch right here. I'll come back to that here in just a second. All right. So what we've done with Nivolo is we've added so that we, we have our own CMMS. So on the left-hand side here, we have our clinical engineering can operate with their devices. And I'll dive into that here in just a second with your inventory, your work orders, all of that. We have a modern CMMS for your organization. What we've done is add a cybersecurity solution on top of it that integrates with all of those cybersecurity products I mentioned earlier. And what it can do is not only know now what medical devices are on your network, what operating system are they running, what active ports are running on those devices. So if there is an out-of-date operating system that hasn't been patched, that has an active RDP port open on it, we can automatically generate, you'll notice right here, an alert coming inbound right here for that medical device. So let's go ahead and bring up this alert. Let's actually take a look at it. So here's an alert that came in for the Blue Keep vulnerability for a medical device that was vulnerable. You'll notice that it does include a link. So this actually links me out to the actual patch for this particular vulnerability. You'll notice this was a Windows XP uh, device and here's all the patches for that. So I have the ability to download that patch for this device. I can see the affected assets. So this was actually an infusion pump that was affected by this particular vulnerability. I can also see the related work order that I auto created uh, based on the security event. So here's the blue key vulnerability. Here's the medical device that was affected by it. Here's the work order that I assigned over to clinical engineering and to the technician. That's all automated, right? So we are able to find the medical device that's vulnerable. We have our vulnerability for blue keep right here. And we can see all the other medical devices that are also affected that also are affected by this same vulnerability. So we can correlate a vulnerability against your inventory and auto-generate work orders for devices that match that vulnerability. We can also generate security incidents, as I mentioned, over to your IT organization, so they're aware of it too. Here's the blow key vulnerability. Here's a medical device that was affected. We also tie it back to the work order. So you see basically that full life cycle of device that's affected on in, from a medical device, auto, flagging it as, as vulnerable, auto-creating a work order to your clinical engineering department and in your security, uh, IT security organization, so you can actually track that full history and when it's fixed and remediated, you'll know the state based on the, the ticket status within the work order and, and the security incident. So that's one area I wanted to show you. One of the other areas I wanna show you is when our inventory. So let's say, for example, we have our device inventory. So I have my device inventory, I have one here, I have a number of these that are out of date operating systems. You'll see I have some that are on running Linux, some that are running XP. Let's take a look at this XP device here, actually. Let's take a look at this one. And let's actually bring up where this device is located. Because I actually want to find out where this device is, is within my environment. We have the ability to pull up a floor map. And as I mentioned earlier, we tie in with real time location services or RTLS within your hospitals as well. So if you're running Stanley Aero Scout or Centrac or Aristaflow or many, many others we've integrated with a lot, we actually can show you where that device is right now. So if I need to physically get out to this device and find where it is, I can do that quickly and easily. Maybe I wanna know where all my Windows XP devices are within my environment. So let me take off this sys ID of this device. And let me actually search for all my Windows XP devices. A couple ways I can do that, I can either filter it right down here at the bottom. So maybe I wanna right click on my operating system and show me all my XP devices. 
here they are. And here's the rooms that they're sitting in. So I can literally find all of the medical devices running Windows XP on my actual floor plan. Now I can do this floor by floor, I can do this site by site. You can get more uh, expansive depending on how far you wanna search. But this is gonna speed up your time, especially if you're looking for hundreds of medical devices, trying to locate where they are. And based on the details that we're bringing in from these the security systems that you have, we now know these devices are running the affected operating system. We need to physically get out there and get these patched and up to date. We have technology to help you do that. And that's where our floor mapping capabilities and being able to pinpoint tying in with your RTLS systems for your mobile devices, we have that functionality as well. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up. This session will be recorded as well, by the way. So you will all have access to the recording after the session. Feel free to send this to the rest of your folks within your organizations or other peers. You thought this would be in, you know, useful too. Hopefully this was informative and helpful for all of you. If you wanna reach out, Send, it, send an email either to myself, ben.person at novolo.com or sales at novolo.com is our direct contact. We'd love to talk more about this with you. If there are any other topics you'd like us to dive into, glad to as well. I appreciate everyone's time today. I want to thank you all for, for joining the session today. Thank you and have a great day.